Right, so you've probably heard the phrase that renting is money down the drain and you've been told your whole life that you should get on the property ladder and buy a home because once you've bought a home, then you're saving money and it's an investment and stuff. And hey, at least you're not renting anymore and throwing all that money away and setting it on fire. But it's actually much more complicated than that. Buying and renting both have financial and psychological costs attached and we need to take into account all of those things when we're making the big buy versus rent decision. So that is what we are talking about in this episode of Money Club, our ongoing series where we discuss the principles, strategies and tools that can help us along our journey towards financial independence. Now, for a long time, I also totally bought into this buying is better than renting mantra, and I followed the get on the property ladder by age X advice pretty religiously. When I started working as a doctor, for example, I sold a bunch of Bitcoin at a loss of about $35,000 to buy a house in Cambridge with my brother. And I also recently bought two flats in Manchester as buy to let rental properties. But right now I am renting a ridiculously expensive flat in London. So I've got plenty of experience from both the renting, throwing money down the drain and the buying, making money side of the equation. So the big question is, is it better to buy a house early and hold it, i.e. buy in your 20s or 30s if you can, or is it better to rent, invest your money somewhere else, and then potentially buy a house further down the line? And we're gonna break this problem down into four main sections. Firstly, we'll talk about the home buying bias, basically why everyone, especially your parents and grandparents, think that buying is better than renting. Secondly, we'll talk about the s'mores rule, which is the mental model I'm gonna to use to break down this belief. Thirdly, using the s'mores rule, we're gonna discuss the financial factors that factor into whether we're gonna buy or rent. And fourthly, again, using the s'mores rule, we're gonna look at the psychological logical factors to consider when we are deciding whether to rent or to buy a place. First, let's chat about why most of us have this home buying bias. The first factor is economic. Now, historically, house prices tend to appreciate, whereas you don't get anything back from renting. So most people think that you're making some kind of investment when you're buying a house, but that when you're renting, you're just burning through cash. I was talking to a friend who grew up in Cambridge and he said that his mum bought their family house in the center of Cambridge for 80,000 pounds back in the 1980s. As the city developed, more and more people want to live in Cambridge. And so the housing market has done its thing. The price has gone up over time. And now that house is worth over 800,000 pounds, which is pretty good. If that friend's mum had just rented all those years, then his family wouldn't have benefited from this massive 10X increase in their net worth over the last 30, 40 years. Okay, so that's partly why we all think that OMG renting is money down the drain. This is really bad. But the decision about buy versus rent is a little bit more complicated than that, which brings me onto our mental model for figuring out the pros and cons of buying versus renting. Buying versus renting is an investment decision and that decision has two sides. One is financial and the other one is psychological. The financial component is about making as much return from your investment as possible. And the psychological component is about making sure that your decision makes you as happy as possible, which is a little bit harder to calculate. For example, if buying a house means you need to move somewhere that you don't want to live and commute for an extra hour on public transport, then you might be better off financially by buying a house, but in terms of happiness, you'd be worse off there. With that kind of like balancing act in mind, I've come up with my own framework for calculating the costs and benefits of renting versus buying, which I'm gonna call the s'mores rule. Now each letter in the s'mores rule stands for a factor that's important for us to consider when applying the framework. So very briefly, S for sunk costs, M for maintenance costs, O for opportunity costs, R for roots versus wings, E for easiness, and S for savings. Okay, so whether we're buying or renting, we need to think about at least three types of financial costs. And these three costs make up the S and the M and the O bit of the s'mores rule. Now we're gonna go through the costs in each of the cases of buying versus renting. The first type of financial cost that we face are the sunk costs. These are the things that we pay for as a one-off and we don't get any money back from them. When we think about buying a house, most people think about the purchase price of the house. Like if the house is a $1 million property, we think that the cost of buying the house is $1 million. The actual sunk costs are the other fees that we have to pay on top of the $1 million to actually buy the house. These are the costs that we don't get anything back from. And conveniently, there are four main types of sunk cost when you're buying a house. The first is property taxes. Now, this is gonna vary a bit depending on which country you're in because there are all sorts of different types of property tax. Basically, it's a tax that you need to pay to the government when you buy a property. How much you pay depends on how much the property costs and whether you're a first time buyer. This comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes for different countries, like stamp duty in the UK, which for most people is between 0% and 5%, or general property tax in the US, which you pay to your state, which is usually between 0 0.2 and 2%. For example, this is what property tax looks like in the UK, depending on if you're buying an extra property or your main home, and whether you're buying a massive mansion or a small flat. Second on the list, we have lawyer fees. You'll need to pay your solicitor to cover the cost of all of the legal work associated with buying a house. 
This includes things like dealing with a transfer of ownership, checking the paperwork is in order, check or checking whether there are any environmental factors that you need to do, like making sure your name is actually the thing on the deed, making sure you have all the relevant planning permissions, anything that might give you a massive pain in the bum further down the line. In the UK, this usually costs between £1,000 and £1,500, depending on how much the property costs. And then thirdly, we have the valuation fee. This is what you pay to the mortgage lender to assess the value of the property and to figure out how much they are prepared to lend you. Getting a valuation costs somewhere between £150 and £1,500. Again, this is based on what sort of property you're going to get and the type of mortgage you're getting. And then there might also be some minor fees on top of that, like mortgage arrangement fees, so fees that you might have to pay to arrange a mortgage, or surveyor's fees, the money you have to pay to the surveyor. Overall, given that you're property taxes and stuff are likely to be maybe up to 5% of the home in the UK for any property above £250,000, you can expect to pay more than 5% of the value of your home in sunk costs when you add on all the lawyer fees, valuation fees, and all that kind of stuff. And obviously this figure varies depending on which country you're in, but that is a very rough estimate for the UK and the US. If you're renting, the main sunk costs are a lot simpler. So firstly, there is the rent you have to pay, which here in London is about £1,400 a month for a one bedroom apartment. And second, you then have the cost of actually moving all your stuff into the apartment, which can add up if you're moving quite a lot. The second type of cost that you get when buying or renting are maintenance costs. Now these are things that you need to pay for to make the place that you've bought or rented actually livable. There is this thing called the 1% rule which says that when you own a home you should budget about 1% of the house price per year for ongoing repair and maintenance costs because all sorts of stuff can and will break during the course of your home ownership like a broken boiler, leaking drain pipes, mold in the bathroom, all that kind of fun stuff. So if your house costs for example £300,000 then you should budget around £3,000 per year for maintenance. Now obviously the 1% rule is just a very rough estimate. Depending on how old your house is or its condition or its location, you might need to put aside more or less than this, but it's a broad rough brush stroke type figure. If you're renting though, the maintenance costs are fairly low, if not zero, because upkeep is technically the job of the landlord. That is one of the main perks of renting. But you do have to pay a security deposit when moving in, and so the landlord can make deductions if it turns out that you've damaged like a load of stuff or your dog has spilled red wine all over your sofa or anything like that. The third type of cost you have to pay, especially when buying, is opportunity costs. Now, opportunity costs are kind of hidden and most people tend not to account for them or even think about them. They're basically the potential benefits you miss out on by choosing one thing over another. If, for example, you decide to study medicine for six years at university, you cannot then also study computer science at the same time, at least in most universities. Not getting to study computer science is then one of the opportunity costs of doing a medical degree. And so if I'm using my money to buy a house, I'm deciding to miss out on all of the other things that I could have done with that money. Like, for example, backpacking around the world or paying to go to business school, you know, God forbid. Someone on my team, for example, my friend Jamie is thinking of buying a house, but to do that, he would have to sell all of his shares in Tesla, which he really doesn't want to do because he thinks Tesla is going to go to the moon over the next 10 years. And so for him, buying a house is going to result in the opportunity cost of that money is no longer in Tesla stock. Similar to me, when I bought my flat in Cambridge, the opportunity cost was having to sell my shares in Bitcoin or my Bitcoins and realize a loss for the Bitcoin. Whereas had I actually kept that money in Bitcoin, it would have gone up so much more than the price of that house did over the last four or five years. But buying a house with a mortgage costs a lot of money. The two big financial costs that make up the price of the purchase are number one, the down payment, which is a percentage of the total value of the house that you pay upfront from your bank account. And usually you, this is roughly 20%, although some mortgages are 25 and some mortgages are five and some are 10, but 20% is a reasonable down payment value. And two, we have mortgage repayments. This is basically the money that you borrow from the bank to cover the other 80% of the cost of the house. And then you need to pay interest on that money. Now, this is a huge financial commitment. If you buy, for example, a $1 million house with a down payment of 20%, you'll need to pay $200,000 upfront. And then suppose that the interest on your mortgage is 5%. If you pay back your mortgage over 10 years, which is pretty quick, then you would have to pay $8,485 per month. And you'd end up paying the bank over $1 million by the end of those 10 years. The initial $800,000, which is called the principal, and then $218,000 on top of that, just to cover the interest payments. All right, let's now look at the opportunity cost of paying that money to buy a house. Now, in most decent cities, it's a safe bet that your house is gonna grow in value over time. So suppose that house prices appreciate, i.e. increase at 5% each year. That means that one year later, your $1 million house will be worth $50,000 more. And so buying the house is actually a pretty decent investment. But if you're paying for the down payment and the mortgage payments, you're also letting go of the opportunity to invest that money somewhere else. So for example, instead of paying the $200,000 down payment and mortgage repayments, you could have invested all that money in crypto and hopefully made more money than the value that the house will have appreciated by with in that year, fingers crossed. So for example, I sold 35,000 pounds of Bitcoin in 2018 to buy a house, but with the benefit of hindsight, that was a really bad move. If I'd kept that money in Bitcoin, it would be worth 175,000 pounds today, which is 140,000 pounds in profit, which is way more than how much my apartment in Cambridge grew in value since 2018, 
where that figure is somewhere between maybe five and 20,000 pounds. Alternatively, instead of buying crypto, you could have invested that 200,000 pounds into something steadier, like stocks in the S&P 500. If you'd invested the 200,000 pounds into an S&P 500 index tracker at the yearly average growth of 7%, then you would have over 283,000 pounds in five years time, which is a profit of over 83,000 pounds. Of course, we've still got to factor in accommodation, like you cannot live inside 35,000 pounds of Bitcoin or a stocks and shares investment account, unfortunately, but buying a house means that you don't then have to pay rent. You only have to pay mortgage payments, which are gradually adding to your net worth by paying off the principal on the property. So if we're weighing up the opportunity costs from renting versus buying, the main question we really want to ask ourselves is number one, what would I be doing with that money instead if I didn't put that money for a down payment for a house? Or two, what would I be doing with my money instead if I didn't rent? And which of these options, buying versus renting, would get me more money in two years or five years or 10 years time? All right, all of this is pretty abstract. So let's try running the numbers using this cool rent versus buy model that my brother's company, Causal, has built, which calculates whether we'll have more wealth in 30 years, depending on if we buy or if we rent. And this is a pretty cool thing that you can use on your own. If you want to, I'll put a link down in the video description. But basically what you can do is you can set all of the parameters that you care about when you're buying and all the parameters that you care about when you're renting. So let's look at the demo example. Let's say you're buying a house for $1 million. The down payment is 25%, so $250,000. The interest rate, let's say, is 3.5%. The one-off cost would be the sunk cost, so let's say that's 5% of the property price. Let's say annual appreciation is between 1% and 2%. And the cool thing about causal, not sponsored, they really should sponsor this video. But the cool thing about causal is that you can literally write one to two and it would figure out and do the uncertainty calculations in the background. And finally, let's assume ongoing 0.5% property costs. So that's all the buying related numbers. Let's look at the renting related numbers. And let's assume that you might be paying $2,000 a month in rent and the rent is gonna increase annually by annual appreciation. So that's all taken care of. And let's assume if you put that money in the stock market, your return would be somewhere between minus two and 8%. So it factors the uncertainty and it takes that into account. Now in that scenario, if we look Look at like what's happening further down the line in the year 2049 you'd actually be about twice as wealthy if you were renting rather than buying. So with these assumptions that we've got here, your wealth is twice as much if you just rented and put your money in stocks and shares rather than if you bought a house, which is pretty interesting. Now, the key thing to remember here is that your mileage will vary and the solution to every single buy versus rent dilemma is to run the numbers for yourself and see what happens. So the key thing here is that our assumptions within buying is we're assuming that the, the house that we buy is gonna appreciate annually by somewhere between one and 2%. But let's change that assumption. Let's say actually, you know, house prices in the South of England increase by somewhere between three and 10% every year. So I'm gonna write three to 10. And now the model is gonna figure out what would these numbers look like if that was my assumption instead, boom. And all of a sudden it's way better to be a buyer than it is to be a renter because this three to 10% increase in, in the house price over time is gonna massively contribute to your compounding wealth over the long term. So we can see by in the year 29, our wealth from buying the house will be somewhere between 3.5 million and 15 million, depending on the different uncertainty estimates. Whereas our wealth from being a renter would be 400,000 to $2.8 million. I'm now gonna plop some numbers in here, which are the numbers that I'm kind of thinking about when it comes to buying or renting a place in London, which is genuinely the decision that I'm facing right now. Okay, so if the house that I buy is for 1,500 pounds or dollars or whatever the thing is, uh, the down payment will be 20% for 300,000. Let's say the interest rate I can get on my mortgage is 2%. Actually, let's call it two to 4% because that might, might vary over time. Let's say 5% one-off costs, one to 5% annual appreciation because I like to be conservative with that kind of estimate. And let's assume 1% annual ongoing property costs. And then renting, let's assume I might want to rent a place that's 4,000 pounds a month. And let's assume the S&P 500 will return minus two to 8%. Here is what this model looks like over time. And you'll see actually that for the first like, you know, 10 years, there's actually not that much difference between me as a buyer versus me as a renter. And really the true value is over time where, you know, in theory, if I were to buy a place in London with all of these estimates, my wealth would be somewhere between 2.5 and $6 million four pounds. Whereas if I were to rent instead, it would be somewhere between 600,000 and 4 million. And you can see that these uncertainty estimates actually overlap. And that's what one of the cool things about causal. It shows you the uncertainty inherent in your calculations because things like inflation rates might change, things like S&P 500 performance might change. So it factors all that into account. You can see it's, it's, it's not as simple as renting is always money down the drain because for the first 10 years of this model, it's basically equivalent and really it's only the compounding over time that makes a difference here. So overall, moral of the story is when it comes to the financial stuff, don't believe the myth that buying is just better than renting on in all cases, run the numbers for yourself and see what happens.
Right, so we've discussed the cold hard financial side of renting versus buying, and the causal calculator is pretty good, but it doesn't take into account the psychological factors. And that's where the RES part of the Smalls rule really comes into play. Now, the first psychological factor to consider within the Smalls rule is something that I call the roots versus wings effect. Now, one of the big benefits of buying a house is that you're putting down roots somewhere. You get this feeling of security and stability because you know that you have a roof over your head, there's no landlord, and you know that it is your proper home. Now, I really didn't appreciate how important this effect is. It turns out that moving houses is one of the more stressful experiences that we as human beings can actually go through. On the flip side, if you're the type of person who wants to live a life where you're moving around every two to three years, or maybe even sooner than that, then buying a house might actually stop you from doing this. And this is the wings part of the roots versus wings effect. Although, yes, we do grow roots when we buy a house, but if we've sunk most of our money into actually buying that house, then we can lose our wings, i.e. our ability to just take off and do something else away from that place. For example, for me, buying a house in Cambridge actually kept me living there way longer than I really needed to. And to be honest, I kind of wish I'd moved to London a little bit earlier rather than staying in Cambridge, but it was the psychological fact of, oh, I own this flat over here that made me feel as if I needed to stay because it was the better financial decision. Now, the second psychological factor is easiness, and this is the E of the s'mores rule. This basically describes how convenient life is to rent versus buy. Now, there are some conveniences you get from renting that you just don't get from buying. If you're like me, you probably appreciate the fact that when you rent, at least if it's in a decent place, you can quite easily to get people to come over and fix things when your toilet isn't working or your boiler isn't working or the ventilation system is broken. You just send an email or a text to the landlord and usually if they are good, they will sort things out without you having to physically call up a plumber or a carpenter or whatever to get things done. But if for example, you're an alpha male and you know how to use a hammer and a nail to fix things, or if you don't mind that extra bit of time and effort that it spends doing it yourself or finding the right person to do it, then this convenience factor or this easiness factor probably doesn't mean very much to you. Now, if you own your house, there are also a few massive conveniences for that. For a start, you can make as many structural changes or painting or decorating as you like without having the landlord breathing down your neck and worrying about your security deposit. You also then have the convenience of feeling rooted, like knowing that, okay, I've got this place and I know I won't have to move for a while, which is an ease and convenience factor. And then there's also the idea to think about that when you're renting, you actually could rent a fully furnished place. This is what I've done in London. And so it's so convenient not having to lug furniture around and just being able to move into a place all of the things are there, the sofa, the beds, the bedding, the towels, the plates, the knives and forks and all that crap, which meant that moving to London was so easy for me because I was renting a fully furnished place rather than how it would have been if I were trying to buy a place instead. So you can't underestimate that when it comes to the ease and the convenience as well. Now, the final psychological factor to think about is savings versus mortgage repayments. Now, this is the second S in the s'mores rule. Now, buying a house is what some economists like to call a saving commitment device. If, for example, you take out a mortgage to buy your house, which most of us are likely to do, then you need to make your mortgage payments every month to make sure that your house doesn't get reclaimed by by the bank. And this actually forces you to save enough money every month to be able to make those mortgage repayments. Now, some of those payments are going to be interest. I, you're literally throwing money down the drain because you're paying for the bank to give you the money to buy the house. But some of that is likely to be the principal. I, you're literally repaying back the loan. And so you're sort of forced to save money and put it into the house over time by virtue of your mortgage payments. And so if you're the kind of person who will struggle with committing to saving X percent a year and saving it in the stock market or in crypto or building up your net worth that way, then buying a house could be a reasonable forced saving device that makes you keep your spending in check and invest in your net worth over time. In theory, yes, we could save the same amount of money if we just rented and invested the surplus in the stock market. But in reality, if we're renting and we don't have a serious commitment like being forced to pay off a mortgage, then most of us are unlikely to ever save up the equivalent of a down payment plus monthly mortgage. Because honestly, most of us are just not wired to save that much without a specific goal and a deadline breathing down the neck. So making the serious financial commitment to buy can benefit us in the long run because it locks us into a pattern of building up our net worth through mortgage payments. Right, so if you have been on the about buying versus renting, or even if you haven't, but you know you might make that decision further down the line. Hopefully, this video has given you a little bit of food for thought. Do think about the components of the s'mores rule and do try running the numbers for yourself because buying is better than renting and renting is money down the drain is just absolutely not true. It all depends on what the numbers and what the assumptions are over time. If you like this video, you should definitely check out this one over here, which is my ultimate beginner's guide to investing in stocks and shares, where we talk about all about how that works and how you can potentially be wealthier by renting and investing in stocks than you could by buying your own property. So definitely check out that video. Thank you so much for watching and I hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.